High Adventure. Tonight, Ron Evans tells us of the plague that was called the Curse of Dagon. Is that you, Bill? Aye. Who else does a stupid woman think it could be? Well, sit down, love, and bring in your dinner in now. Oh, I suppose it'll be the usual rubbish. Here we are. Lovely cottage pie. Again? Cottage pie again? Well, what do you mean, Bill? We haven't sat down to a cottage pie for weeks. I hate cottage pie. Why are you always giving me slops to eat? Bill, what's wrong with you? And you know something else, Hilda? I think I hate you even more than the cottage pie. In fact, you both go together. Oh, please, Bill. Your face is all flushed. You, you've never spoken to me like this before. What's wrong? Shut up, woman, and mind your own business. When you go, take the ruddy pig's will with you. You're ill, I can tell. Look, Bill, I'm going to call the doctor. Never mind, just get me some decent to eat. I'll be back in a minute, love. Oh, Yes, is that you? Whatever it is, I'm tired of people calling me whenever they feel like it, day and night and night and day. It makes no difference. Now do me a favor, will you? Go and jump in the damn river and leave me in peace. Oh. I don't know what's happening. Has the world suddenly gone mad? Poor Hilda Redcliffe might well have wondered if the world had gone mad, because in the small English country town of Bellwater, that is exactly what was happening. Not that Hilda ever learned the facts. A few minutes after her call to Dr. Pierce, she was beaten to death by her husband, Bill. As for the doctor, well, a few moments before Hilda had called, he had murdered both his partner and receptionist with a carving knife. By late evening, the police were receiving hundreds of phone calls, which they did their best to answer. Until they, too, began to act irrationally and with great violence. By early the next afternoon, the area surrounding the town was sealed off, and bacteriologists had isolated an unknown strain of virus that seemed to be causing the havoc. The virus was found to be highly infectious and strongly resistant to every kind of treatment. Bellwater was officially declared a disaster area and came under immediate martial law. Brigadier James Crawford was in command and the medical team, which had taken over a small hospital outside the town, was being run by Professor Geoffrey Brindle. We don't seem to be getting anywhere, do we? It's as though this blasted virus has dropped out of the sky from nowhere. It's not even related to anything we know. Yet, there it is, out there creating sheer anarchy in, in what was yesterday a sleepy country town. All we know so far is that it rises the victims' temperatures and makes them behave in a dangerously aggressive manner. And that's all. We can't even ascertain if it's fatal. But surely there must be people in the town who haven't been affected. I doubt it. Every victim picked up by Crawford's men on the perimeter has been infected. Besides, the telephones were still operating as late as an hour ago. But the few calls coming from Bellwater have been garbled nonsense. <sighs> Only we had a clue where to make a start. Well, we've 63 people working round the clock here. Sooner or later, one of them is going to come close. Yes, meanwhile, the people of Bellwater kill each other or merely starve to death. Can't send any help into Bellwater until we know how to fight the virus. So I'm afraid it might come to that. Hang on, Jeff. Here's the brigadier. Go and see how Patterson and his team are making out. I'll see you later, Kathy. All right, fine. Ah, uh, Professor Brindle. I've been waiting for some kind of report from you. If I had something to report, you'd have had it by now. I don't react well to sarcasms, Brindle. Uh, and I don't react well to being pushed, Brigadier. When you do get a report, do you want it verbal or in writing? Well, in writing, naturally. I see. 
So you think I can afford to sit in front of a typewriter making reports? I can provide you with a stenographer. All right. I'll be blunt. You'll get a verbal report when I have some progress to report. We're not getting along very well, are we, Brindle? It's called a personality clash. Oh, indeed. Well, all I have to say is that your people had better come up with something pretty darn soon. Or I'll... I'll have to take more drastic measures. What do you mean by that? This plague can't be allowed to spread outside the perimeter. Can you imagine the havoc it would cause if we lost control of it? You told me yourself that nobody's immune. I asked you what measures. Drastic ones, I'm afraid. Special clothing is being flown up here as... as well as certain other equipment. You're being very evasive, Brigadier. Very well. If you can't find a solution to this dilemma in a few hours, my men will release a gas. What kind of gas? A special one supplied by the Ministry of Defence. The people in this town will be peacefully... put to sleep. You're looking very shifty-eyed. Do you mean put to sleep permanently? Like we do with sick pets? I can see no other way. You, you can't be serious. There are 26,000 people in Bellwater. It has been discussed at the highest level, and this is the conclusion. The lives of these people will have to be sacrificed if the plague is to be contained. And every minute we wait adds to the risk. At any time, one of my men could catch it and infect another hundred men. And they, in turn, could infect another hundred each. No, Brindle. Time is limited. But this is monstrous. What are Bellwater's inhabitants at this moment? Human vegetables or, or raving homicidal maniacs? They won't know a thing about it. The gas is odorless and undetectable. One tiny whiff kills in an instant. I just don't believe this. It has to be some kind of a sick joke. Can you solve the problem without adding to the risk? Yes. We have to find something that will kill the virus. Well, do it then. You have 12 hours to give me a positive report. Appalled though he was, Jeff Brindle had to admit that the brigadier was right. If a cure to this strange affliction was not found quickly... It could escape from the area with the most terrifying consequences to the country and even the world at large. What were the lives of the few thousand inhabitants of Bellwater compared to the world's billions? Without sleep for almost 20 hours, Brindle frantically continued his search for the vital answer. Happy. I think we've got it. Oh, thank heaven for that. Jerry Lanson has developed a culture that kills the virus in seconds. It worked in ten tests out of ten. Well, that's fantastic, but... Yes, what a... I know, I know there's a snag. How to put it to a real test on a human subject? Well, the army's holding at least 30 people in isolation. You know, people from the town who stumbled into the perimeter. Can't use them. Can't use them? I haven't said why not. We need their written permission. And it has to be given while they're of sound mind. Which certainly wouldn't be true in their case. Mm, yes, yes, of course. Let the army can kill thousands, but we can't use a few to save their lives without permission. Why? Right. How do you mean? Oh, oh nothing. I, I was just thinking aloud. Look, it takes less than an hour from being infected to the victim showing his first symptoms. Use me. Heroic but unthinkable, Kathy. Look, I insist. Be logical. We need every skilled hand we can get. In this kind of situation, you're irreplaceable. <sighs> if we do find a volunteer, it will... Have to be someone outside the medical team. But if you're so certain Lanson's country will do the trick... We then... can't be certain of anything. All right, but what are you going to do then? See what the brigadier can do. I have three volunteers for you. Two of my men and a police sergeant. Where are they? They've been told to report to the isolation unit. Thanks for your cooperation, brigadier. Have you any confidence in this uh, cure? It stands a good chance they... 90% of success. And how long before you'll know for certain? About five hours. Uh, doesn't give you long, does it? The deadline stands, you know. Surely you can extend it. I'm sorry, Brindle. The equipment has arrived and my men are standing by to go in. It can't be changed now. But what if the vaccine we're developing works? I shall call off the operation, naturally. But, Brindle, let me warn you, this cure had better work. You'll have no time for a second chance.
three brave volunteers were locked into an isolation unit after being infected with the virus. Then came the long wait for it to take effect. When it did, it was quick and painfully evident. The three men began to quarrel and fight. Medical workers in protective clothing went in and injected them with the vaccine, at the same time strapping them down to prevent them from injuring each other. When Professor Brindle returned to his lab, he found a sealed envelope on his desk. What's that? Is it the pathological report? Yes. On ten of the victims. Mm -hmm. A bit skimpy on detail. Yeah, they all died because of the disease, but not by it. Five from falls and the others from poisoning. Poisoning? Obviously, when they're in the later stages, they, they eat anything, anything at all. It's odd. As for the disease itself, it causes high temperatures and a swelling of the brain tissues. What we need is... Hello, Professor Brindle. Yes, can I help you? I'm Dr. Howard Barnes. Oh. I've been talking to Brigadier Crawford. He seems to think I might be of some help to you. Well, I must admit we need all the help we can get. What can you offer, Doctor? Only a few facts, I'm afraid. But I think you might find them useful. My particular field is medical history in which I've been termed a leading authority. How could medical history help us? You see, this virus you're fighting, it is known. But we and thought... Please he... a moment. The virus is known, but only from ancient writings. It was known in the 2nd and 3rd millennia BC when it struck down whole communities. Like it has now? Yes, exactly. It was first recorded in the ancient city of Dagon and became known as the Curse of Dagon. Over the following thousand years, there were sporadic outbreaks when entire communities went berserk for long periods. Work was neglected, people starved to death, and mass murder became commonplace. Mm, the story of Bellwater today. Yes, my dear, just like Bellwater. And like here, the Assyrians and Babylonians isolated the stricken communities until nature took its course. Which was? About one-fifth of the population would survive and return eventually to normal. The virus killed its victims? No, no, not at all. The deaths were mostly caused from violence, starvation and poisoning. In fact, the recovering victims suffered little in effect from the disease except for a loss of memory. Well, what happened eventually? Did the disease just fade away? Oh, dear, no, no. A cure was found for it. You, you know the cure? What is it? Ah, that's the snag. It's never been recorded. Damn it, man. Not even a clue? No, it faded from history. But I will say this. It must have been something relatively simple. A herb, perhaps, or some kind of chemical preparation. Is it possible the disease just ran its course? I mean, that the victims developed an immunity? No, no. A definite cure was found. Answer will you, Cathy? Yes, sure. I'd be only too happy to assist you in going over the substances and flora that were available to the people in the affected area at the time. Yes, right. I'll uh, tell Professor Brendel right away. What is it? It's bad news, Jeff. The three volunteers. They're dead. <sighs> As we found later, the death of the three brave volunteers was due neither to the virus nor the vaccine, but a combination of both reacting with one another, which resulted in heart failure. Professor Brindle told no one of the true reason for his haste. Instead, he threw himself and his staff into a frenzy of work. I worked with Cathy Rowlands, who put data into a computer. This, in turn, poured out combinations of substances for the medical team to test. Well, that seems to exhaust all the mineral and vegetable matter available to the Assyrians. Hmm. So now we go on to... Is something wrong, Doctor? No, 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 but I just can't help feeling that we're barking up the wrong tree. The cure we're looking for is something simpler. Well, as fast as the computer prints out the combinations they're being tested, we must hit on the right one sooner or later. But is there much time to spare? Professor Brindle is racing about as though we're facing doomsday. Can you blame him? I mean, if this virus escapes from inside the perimeter, it will be doomsday. Well, shall we get on with it? Very well. 
Let's go on to the fauna of the region. Oh, who goes there? Help! Help me! Stop or I'll fire! No, no, don't shoot! For the love of heaven, don't shoot me! Don't you come any closer now! Listen to me! I haven't got the disease! You all have! You stay where you are! I did have, but I'm all right this now! This is your last warning! You stay away from here! I want to see you! The soldier on guard duty fired at the distant shadow of a woman. When the guard commander came, the soldier explained what the woman had said. This was finally reported to the brigadier, who ordered four men in protective clothing to go out and see if she was still there and bring her back, dead or alive. Brindle here. Just caught a young woman who was trying to get through the perimeter. You might be interested to know that she seems all right. I've put her into an isolation unit, but she's quite rational. Normal, in fact. Says she's had the disease and can't remember the last 18 hours or so, but feels fine now. I'll be right over. Kathy, you'd better come with me. I think we found our first incident of an effective cure. The young woman was named Diana Newton. She was a housewife whose husband was serving with the RAF in Germany. When Brindle and his assistant saw her, she was in an isolation unit, which meant they could only see her through a glass window and speak to her by the intercom system. However, a test showed that she no longer carried the virus in her bloodstream, so the interrogation was then allowed to continue in Professor Brindle's office. I see you were with some friends at home when the disease struck. One of my friends, Linda, suddenly got angry and quarrelled with Janet. They began to fight, and Janet got hit over the head with a bottle of wine. Right after that, Linda ran out into the street, and that was the last we saw of her. And Janet? She was knocked out cold. What happened then, Mrs. Newton? Well, it, it's a bit hazy. We, we tried to look after Janet, but then Vera and Audrey started to argue. Next thing, they were, they were fighting on the floor like animals. I remember feeling very angry, and, and I attacked both of them, and... Well, that's about all. I, I can't remember anything after that. Can't you remember anything at all? Well, it, it was so awful. Vera was lying dead on the floor, a, a kitchen knife stuck in her. The others had all gone. Some people were sitting in the street. They, they looked like zombies. I tried to talk to them, but they didn't seem to understand. I, I knew something awful had happened, so I tried to phone my mum. She lives on the other side of Bellwater. But the phone wouldn't work. Then I listened to the radio, and, and there it was. Bell water was sealed off by the army because of a, a disease that had mysteriously broken out. So I did the only thing I could. I, I waited till after dark and, and made my way to the perimeter. But a guard fired his gun at me, y and... Yes, and... dear, we know the rest. Well, it seems that you've made a complete recovery, and what we need to know is how and why. Kathy. Go and call Dr. Barnes. Right. He might be of some help here. He's still in the lab, I think. An officer questioned me about what I saw in town. It, it's a bit... Brindle uh... here. Have you found out anything? Mrs. Newton is still in a state of shock. I'm questioning her as best I can. Which means that so far you've gone nowhere. Give us a chance. I've only been talking to her for 15 minutes. Well, don't forget the deadline, Brindle. There are... 90 minutes left. You can't go ahead with your operation now. There could be dozens of others in Bellwater like Mrs. Newton. I'm sorry, Brindle. Can't take the risk. 90 minutes is all you have. Now tell me, Mrs. Newton, this meeting you were having, it was uh, sort of a party. Well, not a party as such. I bought a couple of bottles of wine and made a buffet. We take it in turns each Friday night to do the entertaining. When my husband's on leave, he, he calls it a fixin' session. And what did you eat? Well, I made some beef curry and rice, some Cornish pasties, salads and, and a trifle. Well, what was in the salad? Lettuce, tomato, celery, onion, some radishes and... Oh, yes, a coleslaw. And you ate all this? Oh, no, not a bite. The fight between Janet and Linda started before we were due to eat. I see. So, so you just drank the wine? And some cider, yes. What is it? Look, Brindle, we've got trouble. 
There's been an outbreak among my men, and it's spreading like wildfire. They seem to have gone mad, shooting their officers and each other. I'm still as far as ever from a solution. Look, the situation's desperate. I'm going to have to evacuate the hospital and widen the perimeter by at least another five miles. It, it might even be too late for that. Get ready to move. I'll have no time to warn you a second time. What was that all about? I don't know. Let's just carry on. Let me see. We've established you ate nothing, only drank wine and cider. Yes, and there were only women present. Yes, well... Uh... Now, go on, Mrs. Newton. There was an exception. Well, it was nothing, really. Just the man who called with the cockles and mussels. We gave him a drink. He was all right? Behaving naturally? Well, he calls every Friday night, and he was no different. A, a bit of a joker, you know. Now, hold it, Ormond. Did you buy anything from him? Well, we always get a packet of mussels. Did you eat them? No. Damn it, I thought we were on to something. What's that? Shooting. The brigadier's having problems with his men. Just ignore it. So, all this food was left, even after you left to come here? Well, a lot of it had gone rotten by then, but... but I, I, I must have eaten some of the mussels, though. It was, two of the bags were empty, and, and there was that taste in my mouth when, when I got my memory back. Mussels? No, no, no. There were no mussels in the Middle East. <sighs> Ah, but yes. Were they in vinegar? Well, of course. That could be it. Acetic acid. Oh, grief, yes, it could be. We must test it. There's no time. We're going to have to gamble on vinegar. My guess is that you ate those muscles while you were in the late stage of the disease, and bingo, the acetic acid killed the virus. Brigadier Crawford. I think we've got it. Drink some vinegar. Not much. No more than a tablespoonful. Have you gone crackers as well, Brindle? No. Get all the vinegar you can and start giving it out. There's no time to argue. Amazing though it was, we'd hit on the answer, acetic acid, as is found in vinegar. For several hours after the discovery, there was pandemonium, which was caused by a sudden spread of the disease among the military personnel. To give Brigadier Crawford his due, he went about ordering his men to take a dose of vinegar without further questions. The effect of the acetic acid on the virus was astounding. Within ten minutes, the victims began to behave normally. First, the berserk soldiers were treated, and then, at first light, teams of soldiers entered the town and began to treat the victims of the disease. People who were by now long past the violent stage. Nearly 2,000 died during those three days of horror. But now it will be forever on record how to cure the curse of Dagon, should it ever mysteriously occur in the world again. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.